Megan, this is uh, an individual whose life just changed a lot. Yeah. And I suspect that this is a, uh, a sobering experience, a reality check for him to go to the White House and get a national security briefing like that, things he would not have heard as a congressman mm -hmm. before today. But I wonder to what extent he's going to be able to work with this president. I think we can argue that the new speaker is more conservative than the last. He certainly is. He's the most conservative speaker in, in modern times. Uh, I've heard some estimates of going back, you know, generations, essentially. Mm. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see this dynamic play out, especially with this shutdown risk just three weeks away now. Um, you know, he is incredibly, he being Speaker Johnson, of course, is yeah. incredibly conservative, not only um, economically and in terms of advocating for small government, but also much further to the right than even the majority of his party in terms of social issues like abortion um, and, and same-sex marriage. So it's going to be very interesting to see how he navigates where he is politically with the narrow House majority that, that he is leading yeah. and trying to negotiate with the Democratic-led Senate and the president. Someone actually quipped to me yesterday that when they took down Speaker McCarthy's plaque above the Speaker's office, that it should have been a little bit center-right, <laughs> given where this individual's politics lie. But we also heard from House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries on the new Speaker. I look forward to an open and honest a communicative and forward-looking relationship where we'll understand that we will agree to disagree with each other but without being personally disagreeable. However, as House Democrats have made clear from the very beginning, we're going to push back against extremism whenever necessary. Greg, you hear from Hakeem Jeffries talking about an honest, open conversation. It's an individual the Democrats need to work with. This is a split, a divided government. Do you think Hakeem Jeffries and Mr. Johnson can have a working relationship and actually legislate? Well, I think we're still in the honeymoon phase where uh, there is a little bit of some goodwill, maybe, perhaps. I think uh, the speaker said all the right things, uh, at least in terms of getting the body back to work yesterday. Of course, he also then talked about some issues about the border uh, that might be a little bit more controversial. But look, this is, this is a speaker who has a lot of work to do coming in. We ha we've had changes of speaker before, but usually it's a, the beginning of the year where the speaker then has some time to set the agenda. This speaker comes in right in the middle of a legislative agenda that he's got to get done by the end of the year, including spending bills. He's got a couple of uh, supplemental spending bills on top of the regular uh, appropriations process. We've got a defense authorization bill. We've got uh, a whole lot on his plate. And by the way, he's got some contentious votes right out of the gate with uh, a, a vote to possibly excel, expel George Santos, the Republican from New York, from the House. You've got some Republicans who want to censure some Democrats for some things that they've said and done. And so it's still a very partisan House, and we'll see how that carries over. I want to hear from you, Gregory, on the George Santos matter. Uh, but Hakeem Jeffries today, Megan, uh, issued, uh, I guess, a challenge to the new Speaker to take shutdown off the table mm -hmm. for the rest of, I'm assuming he means this session, not, not just this year. Is that actually going to happen? The Speaker has warmed up the idea of a continuing resolution, and the caucus seems to be following him. Yeah, so Speaker Johnson, surprisingly, you know, two days before he was elected, floated this, this plan to, to House Republicans, basically saying, I support either a continuing resolution, this temporary spending bill, mm -hmm. until January or until April. What was so a shocking... wide window. A wide window, yes. But what was really surprising about this was that a continuing resolution, which got, which is what got us to the problems with uh, Kevin with McCarthy. Kevin fire. McCarthy, yeah. So, um, and now these same Republicans who opposed that back in October, which averted the government shutdown then, seem to support it now. Now the devil is going to be in the details, right? right? Because what was not mentioned in his memo was the level of cuts that he would advocate on the the longer term spending bills. Um, the level of spending for Ukraine, what, what we would send to Israel, and these are all things that are going to be difficult to negotiate. Well, Megan, because this is exactly the reason why Speaker McCarthy lost his job, this just says to me that this feels more personal. Are, at some point, are the far right, or these eight or a dozen, that potentially were pushing for Speaker McCarthy to, um, to vacate? At some point, are they going to turn on Speaker Mike Johnson? 
So it, we have a couple of dynamics playing out here. I think part of it is that um, that these hardliners, the, these eight Republicans who, who combined with Democrats to vote out Speaker McCarthy just three weeks ago, they never trusted him from the get-go. They didn't like him in January. They, they were among the same ones who forced him to go 15 rounds to get elected. Now, Mike Johnson comes in. He is more conservative. So they might be willing to tolerate more from him than they were from Speaker McCarthy. We'll see. But like Greg mentioned, you know, it, it, it's a honeymoon period we're in right now. So we could be talking a very different game here in just a few weeks um, if, if he cuts a deal with the president that they don't like. Yeah. What I have been saying is all it takes to overthrow uh, a speaker in this instance <laughs> is, is a, a car full, a, a Honda Civic full of <laughs> Republicans. <laughs> so th that, this, is, this is how narrow that we're looking at. And it's going to be even smaller if they do expel George Santos. Wow. Reminding us, yes, that every vote counts. Every vote counts. And so we've got a headline on the terminal. Gregory Cordy has the byline. George Santos faces expulsion vote in the U.S. House next week. The New York delegation is mobilized on this. What's going to happen? Yeah, well, the, the, the Santos himself isn't quite so sure that he can survive this one. He survived wow. a, a vote to expel before when Kevin McCarthy mm -hmm. saved him by sending it to committee. Uh, then that was a party line vote. Now we've had the New York Republican delegation, which is largely brand new members of Congress who are in very competitive districts we have to worry about next year. They've turned on uh, their colleague from Long Island and uh, introduce this resolution now that under the rules of the House has to be voted on within two legislative days. Uh, if it's a bipartisan vote, there could be a jailbreak uh, because wow. no Republican member wants to go. I mean, this guy's notorious, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he's been the subject of Saturday Night Live sketches. <laughs> he's a national punchline. <laughs> uh, even in faraway districts, people know who George Santos is and probably not a, a good vote to, to be standing up for yeah. George Santos back home. Anne-Marie, so are you telling me Republicans are going to actually do this and lose a vote in this narrowly divided house? Well, that's the issue for... I think what Greg brings up a great point. If you are surround uh, individuals surrounding one of those districts, like Congressman De uh, Desposito, how do you go back to your constituents and say, "Of course, I'm not. I'm going to not vote. For, of course, I'm going to bring up this expulsion because they yeah. have family, friends in the neighboring district. And if you think people around the country know about George Santos, for sure, he is very well known in Long Island. Gregory, quickly. What happens to his district? Who represents these people? Yeah, well, under the Constitution, uh, you have to have a special election. We sometimes think about the Senate, the governor can appoint somebody in the meantime. That's not true in the House. There has to be a special election. Governor uh, <coughs> Hochul is going to have to call the date of that uh, within the next uh, few months. And it's a Biden-leaning district. That's the big problem here. So that as soon as you do have a special election, it's very likely that a Democrat wins that seat, and that narrows the Republican advantage in the House even more. And we know we've seen how precarious the Republican majority is already.